Well, thank you, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, what I'd like to talk about today, a little bit of uh, some uh, the need for a sound decision-making system. I'd like to talk a little bit about some of how Howard Rafer's work has influenced me as well. Um, so let's get uh, started. You know, just before coming here recently, this person is Larry Summers. He was former president of Harvard University, and he was in the administration for a while. He published an article in the New York Times called What You Really Need to Know. And uh, so this statement caught my attention, and he pretty much ended the paragraph with, you know, before it was important to learn trigonometry, and today a basic grounding in probability, statistics, and decision analysis makes far more sense. So that caught my attention, and um, I sent him an email, and then we talked on the phone, and I said, you know, how did you, how, where did the statement come from? And he said, well, you know, when I was a graduate student, I read a book by Howard Rafe, Decision Analysis, and uh, he said I got hooked. And he said, if there's anything I can do to help promote the word about decision analysis, uh, please let me know, and ever since we've been in touch. Um, well, he also talked about decision trees. 46 years later, I was actually involved in a project with NASA. And just to give you some of the things we now take for granted about decision trees, how everybody knows it, not many people still use it. It was a project with NASA, and they were looking at space decisions. Uh, basically, the idea is that at the end of the Bush administration, they wanted to send a man back on the moon. In the Obama administration, they wanted to show the ability to deflect an asteroid from orbit, bring it back to the Earth, and conduct experiments on it. Well, uh, there were, NASA had a lot of information. Uh, that's kind of their mission. Um, they had all the information you could imagine. In other words, they could tell you the positions of different asteroids anywhere. And so we did a session with them, basically. Okay, what's the decisions? Well, they had which vehicle do they send up? Is it a JPL uh, vehicle? Is it a NASA one? Which asteroid should they target? Um, and, you know, they want to balance the amount of new significant research that they're going to do if it's an asteroid that they don't know much about whether they're going to be able to capture the asteroid or not. Well, asteroids, some of them, are just like kind of crumbled bread. If you try to grab them, they'll just crumble. So that would be a mission failure uh, if that happened. And so they wanted to make sure that at least they'll be able to bring something. Also, do they deflect the asteroid first? They might run out of power, or should they grab it first? At least they have something. These were the types of the decisions. And we went through a whole set of analyses with them. Um, there were private investors that said, well, if Congress doesn't fund a major part of the mission, we'd be happy to do it if you put a 3D IMAX camera in front of the mission and take pictures and give us the copyright. Um, that was a complicated decision, and then th they had all the information, and we asked, well, how are you going to decide? They had a weight and rate method of, you know, complexity and all of that. So we started using decision tree analysis, and one of the big insights was that was just a sensitivity analysis. We showed them that um, the probability of capture was actually one of the most important uh, insights here that this was really something they should be working on. And in fact, that was worth more than what some private investors were offering. Well, when we did that, um, you know, we said, work on the probability of capture. That's your decision. We had a meeting with the administration. A few days later, I get this email from my student while I was traveling, says so that, and indeed, NASA issued a call for research, uh, six million dollars worth of research for grabbing the asteroid. Um, if you hadn't worked with decision trees, it would be very difficult to get this insight because if you didn't think about uncertainty, you wouldn't be thinking about, well, how do I try to improve this? Um, of course, uh, the book, Decisions with Multiple Objectives, is a book that has also influenced a lot of my own research and my personal research. Um, so it's an honor here today to be talking about this with Ralph in the audience as well. Um, well, 37 years later, I was asked to do a project on the control of unmanned aerial systems. And let me just tell you a little bit of the complexity of the project. Um, when you think of UAVs, um, they have objectives. And in this particular case, it was surveillance. They wanted to make sure that the detectors have a footprint that covers a large amount of space in a given time, but also collision avoidance. They didn't want those UAVs to collide with each other. And tracking. 
swarming. They needed to fly somewhat relative together, not too close, not too far because of telemetry. Now, to be able to control this and de derive control algorithms for those unmanned aerial systems, it's a pretty hard problem in control theory. You have to find the Lyapunov no function. Um, but when you think of multi-attribute utility, and this is where the influence of Harif comes from, it turns out that if you were able to model the preference function of each of the individual robots with a function that looked like this, and of course, this was inspired completely by the additive and the multiplicative forms uh, because they follow from this for special cases of the function psi, whether it's identity or exponential, um, then something great magic happens. It turns out actually that any function that looks like this um, can be used as an upper bound on the maximum value of the argument. Uh, why is that important? Because, therefore, if you had any control algorithm that was going to minimize uh, this objective function, constructed that way, including the additive and the multiplicative forms of utility, you're guaranteed that if it falls below a certain amount, every argument falls below a certain amount. So if you're trying to achieve multiple objectives, um, then you know that by bringing it below a certain level, every objective is being achieved, and also you can incorporate the trade-offs among the objectives if you use this type of modeling. Not only that, it has a nice, meaningful interpretation. You can assess the parameters as per Keeney and Rafe's book, and so you got it going over there. So using that in terms of the Lapinov function, solved this problem, gave a closed form expression for real-time decision-making. I'm gonna show you something here, I hope it works. Um, can we just add that, click that? Okay, this was just this experiment in the lab. Those robots that you see here, they have footprints. This was in collaboration with a colleague, Dusan Stepanovich, from Control. Um, the blue thing is the footprint. They're trying to maximize it. We actually played around to put them in front of obstacles to see how the collision avoidance is going to work. This whole thing was set with the boundary conditions to push the collision avoidance to the maximum. And see, now, those are making real-time decisions. There's no um, intervention at all from humans. On their own, real-time, calculated, this problem became feasible by using multi-attribute utility uh, as the objective function. And the analysis is simple because it has a real-time closed form expression. Um, so here it is, we have multi-attribute utility uh, in control log. Okay, you know, recently um, Chevron uh, announced this. Uh, it was about building 20 years of Chevron's decision culture. And they talked about how decision analysis, it's building a decision culture in a large enterprise. They talked about how decision analysis has influenced them. Well, they later won the award, the first award offered by the uh, Decision Professional Society. It's called the Rafa Howard Award. Uh, this was just last year. I'm on the committee this year, and we're evaluating other large enterprises, incentivizing them also to adopt this type of decision culture. But there is still more work that needs to be done. Um, and I think we are now, more than ever, with the complexity of systems, um, there will be a need for decision analysts to continue to work closely with other fields. Um, particularly medicine. Uh, we are going to be faced with a lot of amount of data. The question I think that has sometimes deterred decision analysts from getting involved in other fields is domain knowledge. We have to stretch out of our comfort zone, even as decision analysts only, and embrace being able to work with people from different domains. Uh, the, the language might not be easy at first, but once communication starts, I think there's mutual learning from both people that enables proper decision-making and good decision-making in different disciplines. Um, just uh, two weeks ago, uh, we had a workshop at the National Science Foundation. I was asked to give a workshop on using decision analysis in systems engineering. Um, a recent study by the National Science Foundation showed that approximately $600 million per day lost in the U.S. for poor design decisions. That is more than what was being spent on the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and it was very clear that were many misconceptions about decision analysis and systems engineer. It was also very clear that it was important to better understand how to construct value functions and structural models and systems engineering. And this is something that Ralph is going to be talking about. Um, I want to make a distinction here following up on something Detloff said and something David Bell said as well. 
Sometimes we see methods of decision-making motivated by simplicity and that they are approximate. But I want to make a clear distinction here between an approximate and a fundamentally flawed method of decision-making, okay? So using an approximation is something that's like a Taylor series or a Taylor expansion that when you add more terms, you get closer and closer to a solution if you're in within the region of convergence. That's an approximation. There is some rationale and logic. Fundamentally flawed method is no matter how much effort you put into it, you're not getting closer to the original solution. And so we don't want to see methods of systems analysis and decision making in systems and that don't follow the norms just because they are approximations, even though they are fundamentally flawed methods. Let me just give you a quick example here. This is based on a true story. An automobile manufacturer is deciding how to design their new smart car and they had three design decisions number of cylinders, the size, the transmission type. So being a good company, they say, well, let's try to gather as much information as we have about consumer preferences. They get three categories. Group A, one to family sedan. So they say, well, we prefer a medium size to a small. We're not going to buy a small car. We just want a family sedan. We prefer automatic transmission to manual six cylinders to four. Group B, want a small size because they're the sports folk. They prefer manual actually to automatic to give them the feeling of acceleration. They prefer six cylinders to four for more power. And then they get another group C, the big city people that want a small size to save fuel. They prefer automatic to manual and they prefer four to six. Now, you've got the information. Here's how you get it wrong. The company then says, um, well, here's what we have. Should we build a small car or a medium car? Well, one group wants a, does not want a small car, two groups do. Therefore, let's build a small car. One group does not want automatic transmission, two groups do. So let's use automatic transmission. One group does not want six cylinders, two groups do. So let's use six cylinders. Well, by doing that, the company designed this car, which nobody would buy. <laughs> okay, so here's a company, an example where you have information, you have done your due diligence, but when you get the decision-making element wrong, uh, you can end up making bad decisions. And, and that's something that's overlooked. This would be an example of a fundamentally flawed method of making a decision, not an approximation. Uh, and the list goes on of a lot of uh, methods that are used in systems engineering today uh, that still persist. Uh, there's more work I think that decision analysts need to reach out to senior leadership. I think we need to get more and more recognition uh, from people and political figure. So you, you might have heard this, but this was just recent, September 15, 2015. Obama signed an executive order. Pretty much that was in his order saying that, you know, it's research insight how people make decisions. When these insights are used to improve the government, the results can be significant. This was, of course, influenced by the book The Nudge in this particular case, uh, and it was because of a connection of one of the authors with the president himself. Uh, but the list goes on. This was not too long ago, last year. The uh, Department of Homeland Security Secretary says that we need this unity of effort um, so that we can, different departments within the Department of Homeland Security uh, should, even though there's decentralized decision making, we want it to be clear. Um, I had the opportunity to discuss this unity of effort with the Secretary of Homeland Security after this statement and pretty much to explain the implications of what that means. Um, and uh, we've heard this word a lot today. Decision-making large systems is going to require transparency. It doesn't mean that you have to broadcast your values and trade-offs and preferences to the world, but you should know what they are if you want to be consistent in your own decision-making. Um, and I do think that by reaching out more and more to people in leadership, uh, there will be a way for uh, systems-type thinking to spread more and more. Um, in the very near future, and here is a small prediction here, uh, decision analysis and artificial intelligence are going to be just one piece. Uh, we are seeing more and more the integration of decision and, and, and rational decision methods uh, with robotics. Uh, this is seen from the movie Ex Machine. I don't know if you've seen it or not. I would recommend it. It definitely gets you thinking. And more and more, you know, I like to think of this now, uh, decision analysis inside, like Intel inside, kind of the seal that okay, this uh, is fully vested and this makes use of decision analysis. 
I'd like to see more and more of that spread in different fields uh, because this is going to happen in the very near future. And as this happens, uh, transparency is going to become crucial. Um, we see today, and this is happening as we speak, that Google have driverless cars. And they've been testing them for over maybe five years now. Uh, but the question becomes, how are you going to make trade-offs and what are the ethical issues that are going to come? For example, we've seen the collision avoidance algorithm that I just showed you earlier. Um, well, if you're driving a, this driverless car and you have your family with you, and then you know a dog crosses the street or you're about to hit another car, do you want the algorithm to save your family or do you want it to save whoever you're going to collide with? Just some food for thought. In other words, uh, and by implementing those types of algorithms real time in this real time decision making, we are going to be faced with having to make transparent ethical uh, issues and dilemmas. Um, more and more drones being used. Uh, we're gonna be dealing with large data sets and issues while we're doing that of ethics and privacy. I wanna end with one thing. While the field of decision analysis is going to be manifested in many different fields and we're gonna have to adopt it in the very near future, the foundations will remain the same. Thank you all.